Hey everybody, thanks so much for, uh, for being here. My name is Chris Babbitts. I'm a clinical professor here at the law school and delighted to have all of you here for today's event, um, Transparency and Freedom of Information in the Digital Age. We have a really exciting program today based around two panels, a view from the inside panel with some current and former uh, government representatives talking about transparency and FOIA issues and then a view from the outside panel with some representatives from the journalism and civil liberties communities talking about the same set of issues from their perspective and in between a number of great shorter talks um, throughout the day. So I think it's going to be, uh, should be a lot of fun. We'd like to keep it interactive as much as possible so we'll have some Q&A opportunities during the panels in particular. And um, just be mindful as it says on the door when you came in, we're being recorded so just keep that in mind if you stand up and uh, ask a question, which we hope you will. Um, uh, the primary logistical note about the day is that we are starting here and we'll start immediately with three presentations by uh, Jonathan Manis, Esme Caramello, and Michael Morrissey. And we will then segue directly into our first panel, which will also be in this room. And then at about 3.15 or so, we will move across the hall, move down the hall here to 2012, where we will pick up with the second set of programs for the day. And we will entice you to do that by having coffee and snacks along the way. So you can feel free to grab some of those as you make it across the hall, make your way across the hall. Um, I think without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Jonathan. And again, the idea here is this first set of talks, a few different perspectives. Jonathan Manis runs the civil, uh, the FOIA and Civil Liberties Clinic at uh, SUNY Buffalo. Esme Caramello, head of our Harvard Legal Aid Bureau Clinic here uh, at the law school. And Michael Morrissey, uh, uh, who operates Muckrock, which some of you may have heard of. We'll hear more about that in a few minutes. If you have questions throughout the day, feel free to ask me. Feel free to ask the Berkman staff sitting um, outside. We'll do a more full uh, set of acknowledgments and thank yous at the end of the day, but just want to say particularly from the start, thank you so much to the panelists, particularly those of you who traveled in from out of town. Thank you to Mitch Julis, Harvard Law School alum who helped us put this on today, um, and thanks to all of you for being here. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to, to Jonathan. Um, I'm very glad to be the warm-up act here, uh, and uh, it's going to be a great day, I think. So um, so thanks to Chris and to the conference organizers for inviting me. Um, it's a real honor. And uh, you know, it strikes me that the topic of the conference today couldn't be more timely. I'm sure you didn't plan, uh, plan for this to be so timely, but given what's going on in Washington and uh, Trump Tower, I think there's lots to discuss. So um, I want to spend the next 15 or 20 minutes focusing on one um, very specific transparency problem um, that has emerged over the last two administrations um, and which is likely to continue on into the next. Specifically, I'm, I'm talking about the phenomenon of secret law. So to some people in this room, uh, the problem with secret law is all too familiar uh, David McCraw, who I see here, and uh, Jamil Jaffer, who you'll be hearing from later today as well, they've spent years litigating this issue, years of their lives uh, focusing on this um, issue. But uh, to folks who don't uh, focus on it, uh, the notion of secret law might sound like a kind of contradiction in terms. So in this talk, I want to do a few things. First, I want to illustrate what secret law is by giving you a working definition and a few examples um, of how it works in practice. Then I want to use these examples to draw a few lessons uh, about the practice of secret law. Is this not? Oh, sure. Um, so why, why, the idea is to shed some light on a few questions, like why is secret law a problem? Uh, how can we uh, reduce it or cabin the practice of secret law? Um, and then finally, uh, I'll get back to FOIA, and I'll talk about how the Freedom of Information Act relates to secret law, including the current state of play um, with respect to uh, whether FOIA allows the government to keep uh, the rules that govern its national security program secret. Um, and I'll conclude by proposing you know, a few strategies that advocates might want to pursue. Uh, so, so what do I mean by secret law? So well, to put it very simply, um, I mean any kind of legal opinion, legal directive, legal order um, that governs national security or law enforcement programs, but which is, not, uh, which is kept hidden from the public. So the, the key fact here is that these internal rules and opinions are, have to be regarded by government officials as binding on them, just in the same way that an executive order or a court opinion um, uh, or a statute would be binding on them. Um, it's just that these rules are made internally and are not made public. 
So I'll give a couple examples uh, just to illustrate how it works. So uh, take drone strikes, targeted killings. Uh, the government has been conducting targeted killings since 2002, right after the 9-11 attacks. Uh, but the program has expanded uh, vastly under the Obama administration. Uh, as you can imagine, it raises a number of very controversial legal questions, um, maybe most centrally the basic question of what standards the government uses to target individuals uh, for death, especially in places outside of traditional war zones. Uh, so since 2010, the ACLU and the New York Times have been litigating Freedom of Information Act uh, lawsuits to obtain the Department of Justice memos that uh, form the uh, legal foundations for this program. Uh, those lawsuits, though, have been part of a much broader campaign, I'd say, for transparency around targeted killings, and that campaign has involved human rights groups, uh, domestic civil society organizations, journalists, of course, um, NGOs, and others. So how has the government responded to this transparency campaign, these lawsuits? Well, first, it's completely resisted the idea that a court could order it to disclose the memos that authorized targeted killing and set out the legal foundations. It's basically fought the FOIA lawsuits tooth and nail. Um, at the same time, in 2010, the government started, as a, as a matter of sort of executive discretion, it started um, giving a, a number of speeches. Government officials gave a number of speeches starting to outline the uh, contours of the, of the program. Um, the first speech was in 2010. Uh, Harold Coe, who was then the State Department legal advisor, gave a speech. Um, and then at some point, the government also released a white paper that summarized its, well, it was first leaked, and then they acknowledged it was a, an actual official white paper. Um, and that white paper outlined the legal justification for the targeted killing of a US citizen. Um, so back to the, the case law. So in June of 2014, um, in response to the FOIA litigation, the Second Circuit ordered the government to produce the actual Office of Legal Counsel memo um, that authorized the targeted killing of a citizen. Um, but it's important to note that that decision was um, based on sort of the narrow theory that the government had waived its right to classify the opinion because it had officially disclosed essentially the same legal reasoning in the white paper. Um, and at that point, the government chose not to appeal. It uh, stopped fighting to keep that one memo secret. Um, and then this past summer, it released certain other materials, a, presidential, a redacted presidential directive, uh, and certain other memos about targeted killings. Uh, but aside, aside from that, um, it has continued to refuse to disclose um, any of the other legal memos that constitute the legal architecture of this program. So as a result, there's still a fair amount we don't know about targeted killings. That said, I think it's fair to say that six years later, uh, the secret law of drone strikes is less secret. Um, and it's actually now, there's now, we now know enough about the legal arctic, architecture of drone strikes that Jamil, who's not here yet, just published a book about it, uh, about, about the drone memo. So you should go buy that on Amazon.com. <laughs> so, that, so that's uh, targeted killings. Um, I'm going to give one more example. Uh, uh, relates to the NSA's mass call tracking program. So the very first document that Edward Snowden uh, released through journalists to the public uh, was an opinion of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, and that opinion revealed that the court had secretly reinterpreted Section 215 of the Patriot Act to permit the bulk collection of all of our domestic telephone records. Now, if you had looked at the text of Section 215 the day before that decision was released, um, you would have had no idea that this was authorized. It seemed like a fairly limited provision uh, authorizing uh, collection of business records that were, quote, relevant to uh, a terrorism investigation. People had concerns with it, but nobody thought that this was authorizing bulk collection of all of our telephone records on a daily basis. Um, in fact, though, a series of secret rulings by the FISA court had made it so by reinterpreting the law in secret. So those are just two examples of secret law and practice. There's lots of others I could have chosen from, um, things like torture under the Bush administration, uh, government watch listing programs that are still ongoing, um, many other surveillance programs uh, that are uh, operated in accordance with uh, classified directives and legal opinions. Um, but what can we learn from just these two sort of examples? So I'm going to discuss three key lessons. The first. Uh, I think is that secret law exists. This is a real thing. Um, 
In fact, I'd argue that it's a key feature of the way that the national security state is governed today. So some people imagine that when it comes to national security, it's really, this is a space that isn't really governed by law. This is sort of like a Schmidtian domain where executive branch officials just exercise pure discretion to do whatever they think is necessary to protect the nation. But I think that that vision has been uh, proven false. Uh, and folks like Jack Goldsmith at this law school have uh, pointed out that the national security bureaucracy is full of lawyers and legal opinions and legal rulings and legal directives. Um, so I think maybe the better way to characterize it is that the key thing that, or one of the key things at least, that distinguishes um, this national security legal ecosystem is the very fact of secret law. The idea is that in the national security domain, unlike pretty much any other, uh, the governing rules and interpretations can be hidden from the public more or less at will. So the second lesson that I want to draw from these examples is that, uh, corros that secret law is, is corrosive and dangerous in, um, in a number of ways. So uh, you know, secret law makes it impossible for us, members of the public, to know um, what the rules are and to gauge in you know, democratic oversight of those rules. Um, it's also difficult or impossible to tell whether the government is violating its own standards if we don't know what those standards are. Uh, in some cases, like with the Section 215 program, uh, when there are secret legal opinions or legal directives, it can actively mislead the public about what the law allows. Um, so none of us thought that bulk collection was authorized, um, even though it was in secret. More broadly, um, zooming out a little bit, I think that secret law poses a basic challenge to individual liberties. And that's because uh, one of the key protections for individual liberties is that we as citizens get to know the rules that the government has to follow. Um, where those rules are secret, only the government knows what limits it's supposed to respect. And as a result, from the perspective of an ordinary citizen, um, it's often going to be impossible to tell the difference uh, between action that's allowed under secret rules and action that is arbitrary or lawless or illegal. And this creates a sort of fundamental power imbalance between citizens and the state. Um, we just don't know what the line is between what's legal and what's not, and we can't govern our own actions accordingly. So just one last major problem with secret law, um, and that's that it makes it difficult for Congress to act as an effective check in the executive branch. Um, so even if Congress or members of Congress are read into these programs, um, if they can't speak about them publicly, they can't, uh, they can't uh, do much to, to check the executive branch. Um, they can't do things like hold public hearings. Uh, they can't issue press releases. If they think that there needs to be a legislative amendment to fix a secret law problem, they can't explain to us why it's necessary because they can't talk about the secret law. Um, so in other words, uh, congressional oversight is at best much weaker when the rules in question are secret. So you know, I think there's reason to be skeptical of secret rules. Um, now, the, the third lesson I take from these examples is that uh, when secret law has become public, when we have learned about the content of these rules, uh, it usually has not been as a result of victories in court, at least not directly as a result of victories in court. Instead, the secret laws uh, that have become public have almost always become public in one of two ways. Either the government chooses to stop fighting and to uh, disclose documents as a matter of discretion. Um, that's what happened with most of the targeted killing memos. Or a whistleblower decides that it's worth taking a risk and leaks the documents to journalists who then publishes them. And that's obviously what happened with Snowden. So that's not to say that FOIA lawsuits are, aren't essential or aren't important, um, but that lawsuits alone haven't been enough to get transparency in this area. Um, the key, I think, has been to organize uh, broader movements uh, pushing for transparency. Um, and in all the cases that I'm aware of where secret laws become public, uh, there has been a coalition of civil society groups uh, and um, lawyers and journalists all pushing in the same direction for transparency. Uh, you know, that said, FOIA litigation does play an important role in these transparency campaigns. Um, you know, a federal lawsuit focuses public attention on the issue. 
um, like nothing else. It can define the parameters of the transparency fight. Um, even more practically, a FOIA lawsuit requires the government to come to court to give reasons for why secrecy is necessary, um, to make a decision about what exactly it's going to keep secret and how it's going to represent those reasons to the public. Um, that process itself can prompt the government to change its position, um, even if a court doesn't order it to, to do so. Um, but ultimately, the courts themselves have generally not been willing to order disclosure against the will of the government, except in uh, narrow cases. So, so the so so the state the state of the FOIA litigation is mixed. Um, but even if FOIA alone hasn't been enough to combat secret law, I think I think it's still worth taking seriously the idea that the courts could rein in this practice. Um, at the very least, it seems unlikely that Congress or the executive branch are going to be uh, taking steps to reform uh, these practices. So we, the courts might be the only, the only game in town, so to speak. Um, so I'll spend just a couple of minutes describing the current state of the case law, challenging secret law, um, and then I'll talk about maybe some ways forward. Um, so the basic question in these FOIA cases, as suggested, is whether the government can withhold documents that constitute the governing law of an agency if those documents are marked classified. Um, and you know, in a 1975 Supreme Court opinion, uh, NLRB v. Sears, the Supreme Court held that the government um, couldn't withhold, uh, quote, working law uh, by claiming an evidentiary privilege, like the deliberative process privilege. Um, but it left open the question about whether it could withhold working law on the, ground, on the basis that it's classified or national security um, secret. Uh, so the courts of appeals appear to have answered that question in the negative. That the working law doctrine doesn't act as a limit on the government's power to classify information. Um, but that said, there's a closely related question about whether the government can classify pure legal analysis. So the idea is that the legal analysis in something like an Office of Legal Counsel memo could potentially be separated from the classified facts about the program in question, so that that legal analysis alone should be disclosed. Um, and then the idea, of course, is that disclosing the pure legal analysis might uh, constitute a major part of the secret law or the rules that govern uh, the program, even if we're not learning much about how the program actually operates. Um, so as far as I'm aware, this question about whether pure legal analysis can be classified is not yet resolved. Um, I think it's pending in the Second Circuit. Um, but I think it's worth remembering that even if the courts ultimately find that legal analysis can't be classified, uh, that's likely to amount to like a, a fairly narrow victory uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, first, courts have been pretty quick to find that legal analysis is intertwined with facts, that it discloses something about the program. Um, Second, the judicial determination involved here doesn't allow for any consideration of the public interest in disclosure. Uh, the only thing the court can consider is whether disclosure would plausibly cause some possible national security harm, if there's any risk to national security. Um, it can't consider whether that harm is outweighed by the public interest. That's just not part of the doctrine. So it strikes me that right now the prospect that FOIA litigation will constrain secret law is fairly mixed, at best. So these last couple of minutes, what I want to tentatively propose is that maybe we should be starting to think seriously um, about making other kinds of arguments in court, specifically constitutional arguments uh, against secret law. So it strikes me that there uh, are plenty of resources in the Constitution that might be um, relevant. So for example, the Due Process Clause might, uh, might uh, compel the government to provide notice of what the law is when uh, program intrudes on a protected interest in life, liberty, or property. Um, I think there's also an argument that the First Amendment, which guarantees a right of access to courts, official proceedings, and, and certain records uh, related to those, could be extended to encompass a right of access to governing agency law. Um, and under the Fourth Amendment, when it comes to searches and seizures, uh, you might argue that a search is constitutionally unreasonable if it's conducted according to rules that are uh, secret that the target can't know. Um, there's also various structural provisions in the Constitution that I'd argue uh, suggest that the Constitution is hostile to secret laws. Uh, I don't have time to get into uh, the details now, and frankly, there's a lot of work to flesh these arguments out um, to see if they have any legs. 
Uh, there's also hard questions about how to get these arguments in front of a court. And um, I fully expect that many people in this room will uh, think that the idea that the Constitution puts limits on the power of the president to make secret rules is completely off the wall. Um, so, but, but if, I guess if we've learned anything from the recent history of the Supreme Court, it's that yesterday's off the wall argument can find its way into tomorrow's majority opinion. So, so if, if the Commerce Clause uh, doesn't authorize the uh, government to enact the health care mandate, Who's to say that the, the, the Constitution doesn't allow the president to govern according to secret rules? In any case, um, at the very least, I think that developing these kinds of arguments, advancing them in public, bringing them into court, uh, could help to further galvanize uh, public movements to demand greater transparency and accountability about the rules that constrain the national security state. And that seems like a conversation that is more important now than ever. So. Thanks very much, appreciate it.